Oh, welcome to Convergent Dialogues. This is Xavier Bernier. On this episode, I am very excited to be talking with Robin Hansen. Robin is the Associate Professor of Economics at George Mason University, and he is also the Research Associate at the Future of Humanity Institute at Oxford University. He has a very interesting background uh, within the social sciences at large. He has a bachelor's in physics from the University of California. He has uh, two masters in physics and philosophy of science. And he has his PhD from uh, California Institute of Technology. He is the author of a handful of books. Uh, most notable is The Age of M and The Elephant and the Brain. And he has a wide range of interests, um, many of which we discuss. Uh, we mostly focus on The Elephant and the Brain. Um, obviously, he works on economics, you know, philosophy, psychology, political theory, alternative institutions, um, and many, many other uh, issues. We start the conversation by talking about how do we understand motives and why they're hidden. We talk about how this is motives are different from bias. Uh, we also talk about kind of the unconscious mind and how not violating norms are really important, even though it's the unconscious mind uh, at play. We uh, touch on free will a little bit. We talk a lot about status and signaling, dominance and prestige and coalitions and how norms fit in there. We talk a little bit about council culture. Um, what's offensive is not necessarily illegal. We talk about big and small norms. Uh, we talk about self-deception. And I'd say a little bit over halfway through the conversation, we talk about something that he said he's been working on for uh, a little bit of time over the past couple of months, something called the sacred. Um, and I have to say it was, it was very interesting. I hadn't heard it framed in the way that he uh, discussed it. And so I was, I was very engaged. Um, it was very, very fascinating. Uh, we talk about his idea of Hucharchy and we end on a fun note. Um, we talked about our aliens out in the universe and his ideas about that. Um, this was just such a wonderful conversation. Uh, Robin is, is kind of a, a polymath of sorts. He's, he's just in everything. And he has, he's such a novel thinker, really outside the box thinker, just, just quite exceptional. And while we talked a lot about the elephant, the brain, uh, the, the book, um, he has so many other issues and we spend maybe the last 20 to 30 minutes on that. And, uh, my hope is he'll, he'll come on again uh, at some point in the future and we can talk more about all those other issues. Um, the conversation's you know just at two hours, and um, I, I really could have gone another two or three hours to be quite honest. He's he's uh, he's such a captivating and engaging uh, person to talk to, and so I'm very very happy to, to bring my conversation that I had with uh, Robin Hansen. I'm here with Robin Hansen. Uh, Robin, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I am uh, really excited to to talk with you. Nice to meet you, Isaiah. Yeah, of course. You've uh, you've written a few books, um, and you have you have a wide range of, of interest, which I hope we can we can touch on some of them, uh, which will be a lot of fun. Uh, first, um, one of the most I think it's the most recent book you wrote with uh, Kevin Simler. Yep. Uh, it's called The Elephant in the Brain: Hidden Motives in Everyday Life. This is one of those books that. I feel like everybody kind of talks about. I, I hear people all the time. They 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 talk about this book. I and, hope so. <laughs> I mean, I've read it twice. It's it's very good. Um, so I, I find it uh, uh, really really novel in some ways, and so I'm I'm excited to talk about that. So before we get into it, <clears throat> just tell folks, uh, listeners who don't know you, um, you know, just kind of who you are, what your background's in, um, what you do now, and uh, any any ideas you're working on. I'm an associate professor of economics at George Mason University in Fairfax, Virginia. I long ago started out in engineering, then I went to physics. I did philosophy of science for a while, went back to physics, did nine years of computer research doing AI and Bayesian statistics, mm -hmm. then went back to grad school to get my PhD in social science, where I first did better on the political science market, but then got a postdoc in health policy, after which I got my tenure track job here in economics at George Mason. Mm -hmm. And when I finally got tenure, you know, seven years later, I sp spread out. I did, started my blog called Overcoming Bias. Mm -hmm. 
and eventually did two books. Uh, the first one is a futurist book called The Age of M, Work, Love, and Life When Robots Rule the Earth. And then the second book here, which is considered a psychology book, mm -hmm. The Elephant in the Brain. And I am most famous for prediction markets, which are betting markets on various important policy things. I have lots of ideas for reforming many kinds of social institutions. My most recent work the last couple of years was on grabby aliens and the great filter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I just generally try to look for neglected important things. <laughs> well, the, amazingly, the, there are a lot of important <laughs> things. <laughs> the real question is: is what don't you look at? What aren't you studying? What aren't you writing out? That's that's what's so so incredible because you you're obviously prolific, but it's not like oh, this is an interest. It's like you have so many uh, well, uh, experiences in so many things. In one of my talks, I show a diagram from the map of academia. So um, many people have taken co-citation connections. I, when papers cite each other as, as a way to map out the space of academic work. Mm. And it basically turns out to be a circle. Mm. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. all my stuff is on one side of the circle. <laughs> so <laughs> the opposite side of the work is, is, is geology and biochemistry mm. and medicine, those places where there's just all this detail stuff. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's just millions of papers written about all this detail stuff. And I don't know any of that stuff. <laughs> and I don't try to. Mm -hmm. My stuff is over on the abstract side, mm -hmm. high level abstract theory. Yeah. That, well, you know, you and I, I think we'll have a good conversation and I love the abstract stuff. So, <laughs> so let's, let's first, I definitely, a, a lot of your other stuff is really fascinating. Maybe stuff from some of your first book and obviously stuff you've written on your blog. Uh, I do want to get to that, but let's start first with, uh, the elephant in the brain. So it's, you know, again, it's, it's, it's a fantastic book. The major thesis here is that as humans, we have all of these hidden motives, things we're not really cognizant of or conscious of in the moment, um, and that we're designed to act on them. So maybe just, just kind of give us the kind of thesis that you guys were working on and, and maybe tell us what is the elephant in the brain, just kind of the central focus. Well, maybe you'd like to hear why I was interested in the first place. Sure. sure. Yeah. So, as a social scientist and you know wannabe inventor um uh, as a scientist i keep coming across these areas that just don't make that much sense mm. so the first of which was medicine as i did my health policy postdoc where our usual stories don't just don't fit very well with a lot of de data a lot of details mm. and then we have based on our usual theories proposals for how we could make the world much better and the world is just not very interested. Mm. And these were the presenting puzzles mm. that made me wonder what's going on. And with respect to, say, social science puzzles, people have come up with a lot of more complicated theories or subtler effects to try to explain these deviations. And at one point, it occurred to me that a very simple alternative explanation for many things was to you know leave alone the usual kind of economic theory the usual the kind of mechanisms the kind of things we think are happening in the world but just change the motives mm. just ask well what if people are trying to do something different here than they usually say and it turns out you can go a long way with that mm. first with medicine is where i first realized you could just understand a lot of medical puzzles if you thought in terms of what if there's just a different purpose for this thing and then other areas fell in line, like med like education, politics, et cetera. Once you open your mind to the idea that people may just have different agendas than what they usually say, mm. but they are pursuing those agendas in straightforward mm. ways without other weird things necessarily going on, then you can just make sense of a lot of things going on in the world by saying they're just doing them for different reasons than they say. Mm. But I guess the thing that's interesting here is that people themselves don't understand their own motives, yeah? Right. So for each of the real motives that's going on, they are a reasonable motive to have. Mm -hmm. They're the sort of thing that a creature like you might want to have. Mm -hmm. So a meta puzzle about hidden motives is why are they hidden? Mm -hmm. Why bother to hide them? Why not just own up to what mm -hmm. they are? Mm -hmm. uh, but first... I think many people have to be convinced that there are hidden motives. So our mm -hmm. listeners are not yet convinced, I presume, that <laughs> even such things even exist. Now, most people are aware that some people, some of the time, aren't very aware of their motives. That's a common resource all of us have in thinking about the world. 
Mm -hmm. we tend to think it's less true about us and we tend to think of it as an exception Mm -hmm. and the story of our book is that it's just a lot more common Mm -hmm. than you realize how is this uh, uh, maybe this isn't uh maybe this isn't fair to ask just yet but how would this be different from what people kind of say as is an unconscious bias right people talk about this you know they throw this word around this phrase around how are hidden motives and maybe biases i guess you could say so right. whether it's an unconscious bias or hidden motive or just motives and bias in general how how do we understand is there a difference and if so what do you think is is going on there so there's an area of economics called behavioral economics mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that postulates many biases. And in general, these biases aren't functional or beneficial. Mm. They're mistakes. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, the story is that humans are just very complicated and the world's very complicated. And so they have all these quick and dirty heuristics for many things and then they go wrong. Mm. We just can't get it right. Um, That's one meaning of the word bias, and it's common sort of framing. So many people look at the world around them and think people are just making huge mistakes all the time Hmm. because everybody's just really confused or really stupid. (laughs) And that's a common way people try to understand the world, Mm -hmm. especially when they try to understand why people think differently from them. Hmm. Um, Whereas our hidden motives are more about not mistakes. The thing you're doing is a reasonable thing to do and you are actually roughly effectively achieving it Mm. it's not an error or a mistake Mm. uh, but you are blind to it Mm. Mm. yeah that's a really good distinction i think because it sounds like one is more uh or potentially more adaptive whereas one is more of just certain types of mistakes that we're making when we're theorizing a problem is that some kinds of theories are too easy Mm. and therefore sort of too easy to apply to anything. Hmm. So in some sense, you know, anytime you're apparently trying to do A, and then you don't achieve A, you achieve B, Mm -hmm. I could say, well, yeah, but you were really trying to achieve A, you just made a mistake. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in some sense, it's too easy to explain everything as an error with respect to whatever postulated, you know, motives or purposes you have. Uh, because errors could be in any direction all the time, right? Mm. The problem, it might be more if you see a systematic pattern in the errors sure. over and over that pe- different people in different times and places and different situations all make the same sort of error. Mm. Now you have to ask, how is it that there's this huge correlation in all these errors? Mm. And you might posit that somehow evolution made one choice a long time ago and spread it around so everybody's making the same error, but it does get a little puzzling. And then, you know, if you have processes for pointing out errors and correcting errors, and if people have been pointing out the same error over and over again for a long time, you might say, well, how come nobody seems to catch on? Mm. That's also Mm. a problem with the error theory. Mm. Now, a related theory that's nearly as bad, but not quite as bad, is the social conformity theory. Mm. You could say, well, why are people doing B instead of A? You could say, well, because there's conformity. Other people around them are doing B and they feel they've got punished if they don't do B, so everybody does B. Mm-hmm. But of course, this theory could apply to any B, C, D, E, or F, G. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you could postulate social conformity as the explanation for any possible behavior, as mm-hmm. long as everybody's, lots of people are doing it similarly. Mm-hmm. It won't explain, you know, enormous variety in behavior. Uh, conformity is harder to explain, you know, a lot of local variety and across people, places, and times, but to the extent there's a behavior that's common, you can just say conformity. But again, mm. it's almost too easy. Mm-hmm. It's almost like it's, yeah, it's, 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 it doesn't, it's, it doesn't have as much explanatory power. It's almost just like, well, right. sure, that's an easy thing and that's fine. Right. It's very reductive, it sounds like. Right. But if you postulate a specific motive, then that will have implications about what sort of behaviors would achieve that motive. Mm. And as context change, the behavior should change to adapt to that context if you have a motive. So a motive explanation, you know, has a lot of demands on it. Mm. It's Mm. going to be much easier to say that's wrong Mm. if you can, you know, play out the details of the motive. So you're sort of putting yourself up to be shown wrong more easily if you say, no, the reason you're doing this is because you have this motive. Mm. It's a very, it's a very interesting outlook. You, you mentioned the elephant in the brain and early on, 
And you say it's rooted in some aspects of selfishness, although you say it's not entirely just that. It's a little bit more nuanced. Could, could you say this kind of self-serving kind of thing? What do you mean by that? Well, so the key idea here is that our ancestors were very social. And so humans evolved to be very social and that other humans were the, the main environment that mattered. Mm. Together, humans had pretty good mastery over their larger environment, but the thing they hadn't mastered was each other. Mm. And as social creatures, humans evolved norms. We evolved rules about what we should or shouldn't do and a way to enforce those through language and weapons. Mm -hmm. And that was a dominant key feature of the human environment is that we had norms, languages, and weapons to enforce them. And so that we would each, you know, thrive or not, depending on whether others successfully accused us of norm violations. Mm. We wanted to be safe from norm violations. So that became so important to us that plausibly our conscious minds are mainly there to manage that process. That is, your conscious mind isn't the president or king of your mind. It's the press secretary. <laughs> its job is to watch what you do and then come up with a story that explains why what you're doing doesn't violate norms. <laughs> and if possible, to find your rivals and find a way to explain that what they're doing does violate norms. That's what you're doing all the time with mm. your conscious mind. You are making key choices in your life, but that's not the conscious part of you making those choices. That's mm -hmm. some other part of you that you're just trying to justify. So mm -hmm. the reason why you don't know what you're doing is the same reason they say the president's press secretary doesn't actually know why the president does things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're better off not knowing and making up good sounding stories. <laughs> it, well, I guess in this way, you mentioned that it's, Hidden modes are personal, social, and institutional. So how do these three domains fit into what you're saying about how we have this evolutionary history of where we've created these norms, we've created certain things, and how do we how do we have our motives in all of these three categories? So our main analysis is distal or at a distance. Mm -hmm. That is, we're looking at large categories of behavior like medicine, education, politics. And we're asking first, what are the main patterns of behavior here? What are the main things we're doing? And what are the main effects of what we do? And then we're asking from a distance, what would be the fundamental evolutionary pressures, biological or cultural pressures that would matter there? And we're looking for a match between the plausible things we might be trying to achieve and the actual things we do at a distance. So. That distant analysis leaves a lot of different answers open for the proximate causes and, and structures. That is, evolution could have had many different ways to encode your habits and your inclinations so as to achieve its distal purposes. Uh, and we're therefore not speaking so much to that. We're not making such claims. So. I mean, the key point is in your head, you have a sense of what you're doing and why, and that may well just not correspond to what you're really doing and why, but how exactly evolution gets you to do what it wants you to do is less clear. Mm. We're, we're basically doing the first cut analysis of just saying, what's going on here? Mm. What's the point of this? <laughs> mm. I mean, you, you might have thought that we would just know how long known this. I mean, mm. you, you should be surprised, honestly, that the kinds of questions we're ask, and asking here haven't long been answered. Mm. Why? Why do we go to school? Why do we go to the doctor? Why do we vote? You know, why do we joke? Why do we talk? You might have thought that we would have long since known the answer to these questions. How could these very basic questions be up in the air? And then the claim is we've been really sloppy about this. We've been mm. way too easily assuming that the thought that pops into our head about why we do these things actually is the reason we do these things. And so we have to go back to ground to basics and reevaluate those. So mm. that means there's still a lot of room left once we reevaluate those things to mm -hmm. fill out the details of how exactly that works. Okay. So I, I wasn't I wasn't going to bring this up, but since since we're here, I, I'm curious for your thoughts on this, and and maybe it's not related. So I usually avoid this topic just because people get bogged down on terms and stuff. Right. But I feel like you might have some interesting thoughts here. So where does 
where does these ideas that you're talking about these various hidden motives we have these different kinds of systems of how these kind of you know kind of primordial kinds of ways of of working from an evolutionary history so would it be fair to say in your estimation and you can define it how you want that we don't have free will and and this idea of free will because it, it seems very sort of uh kind of in the atmosphere of what you're discussing of like well we don't know this or we, <laughs> we haven't we haven't distilled well, it enough or so how, how do you understand the free will piece here I always find the free will versus determinism debate to be just, it ends up being about what words mean and I, different uses I, of the I words. Fully agree with uh, you 100%. I fully uh, agree with you. So, but I mean, the thing, you know, without invoking the words free will, the determinism, and just trying to say what's true near those words, mm -hmm. I would say there are causal processes inside you that influence what you do. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are also influences that come from outside of you that influence what you sure, do. Sure, sure. In principle, there could be such some residual randomness, but it hardly matters. Mm. Residual randomness after the causes that come from outside of you and the causes come from within you really don't make much difference to how your life goes. So if that's what free will is about, who cares? Mm -hmm. uh, now, I mean, the key point is the influences that come with thought in, within, from within you are not entirely visible to you they're not transparent so at some point you just make a decision and you don't know why mm -hmm. that doesn't mean there isn't a why it just means you don't know why mm -hmm. but that can feel like free will mm -hmm. you can think i can decide anything i want i can mm -hmm. go left or can right mm -hmm. i'm gonna go left there it was i did free will well mm -hmm. what you saw you went left you don't know exactly what inside you made you go left you just know that you can't see it mm. um so, but you could be pretty sure it came from within as opposed to without, except that everything within once came from without, mm -hmm. all of your in is the result of outs in the past, mm -hmm. but you could maybe be more sure it didn't come from without in the last five minutes mm -hmm. or something like that, or even the last five years. If and so to, and to some people's concept of free will, the key point is that other people didn't decide for me what I did mm -hmm. or other outside forces didn't decide what I did. I decided. Mm -hmm. And well, for many things, that's true. Mm -hmm. You decided that is things within you made this choice, of course, based on things from outside before, but <laughs> <laughs> evolution on the outside made who you are. Then your parents and culture made you mm -hmm. who you are as a child to become an adult. And even today, what you read in the paper, et cetera, is continuing to reform you. But still, when you just now went left, that probably wasn't the CIA pushing a button. That was you deciding to go left. Mm -hmm. I think that's typically very difficult for people to accept. And so in the same way, I wonder if many of the things you've been describing about <clears throat> these hidden motives, it, it can be very... Well, people like it when it explains things they want to know about, and then they don't like it when it doesn't help them or they, they feel less, less positive about it. And I guess I wonder here, you, you, you mentioned this idea of situational awareness. W what is the, the key element there of, of why you guys introduced that early on and why that's so important? Well, we ask, why would you want to know what we're about to tell you in the book? So it's a kind of epistemological question. Why, why do we want to know this? Do you? I mean, or we think you? it's actually a live question. We, we're mm. not sure. You do mm. want to know. So mm. we actually want to have you ask the question mm. and consider it to be mm. fair to you because we may do you a disservice by telling you things that, in fact, if you don't, don't want to know, <laughs> don't, if you don't want to know, don't read the rest of this book. Right? <laughs> right. And we think we should do that because compared to most things people read, this does have a much higher chance of being the sort of thing people don't want to know. Mm -hmm. So the, the most fundamental thing to notice here is that evolution, cultural and biological, designed you and your culture to not know these things. That right. wasn't an accident. Right. The reason why you don't know the things that we are telling you is not because they're unimportant or because they're too complicated mm -hmm. or whatever. They are simple. They are important. They're the sort of things that evolution and culture would very much have told you and you would already know if they thought it was in your interest to know. Mm -hmm. So they've decided it's not in your interest to know. Mm -hmm. And 
The question is, are they right? Mm. So that's actually a pretty strong presumption to have to overcome. Evolution, in all its great wisdom, thinks you shouldn't know this. So what makes us think you should? Mm. So we can carve out some exceptional territory where at least in these exceptions, maybe you want to know. And so then we'll ask you, are you an exception? Mm. If you're not an exception, maybe you don't want to know. Okay, first, some of us specialize in studying human and social behavior. Our job is to think about reforming education or politics or medicine. And we really can't do that very well if we don't have the foggiest idea of what's going on. Mm -hmm. And the message is, you, you might not actually have the foggiest idea of what's going on in these major areas of life. And so if you're not going to actually figure out what's actually going on, then you should just probably sit down and not try to pontificate on how these <laughs> things should be changed. You, you just don't know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to pick that as your specialty and say that that's your role in the world, and that's your mission in life, then you should know. Mm. Okay. That's one kind of exception. Uh, another kind of exception is that your job may be very specialized to needing to know and understand people. You might be a manager or a salesperson. Mm -hmm. Roles that didn't really exist in that sort of strength of form thousands of years ago when evolution you know, formed your habits. So evolution didn't anticipate what it would be like to be a manager or salesperson. Mm -hmm. And it didn't know that you should be an exception if you are one of those people who just really needs to understand people. So here, this is about understanding people and what they're doing and why. You may be in a position where you really need to know that. Our third exception is one that, like the first, maybe also applies to me. You're just really nerdy. <laughs> Most people glide through the social world with their intuitions telling them roughly what to do, and it usually works. Their intuitions are right. Mm -hmm. They've got you know, a sixth sense or whatever about when to do what or when not to do what. They don't know why they're doing these things, and often their conscious thoughts are just wrong about why, but it works. Mm -hmm. Some of us are just less socially skilled than others. Mm -hmm. Some of us, our intuitions aren't very good. The thing that intuitively comes to our mind to do just goes wrong a lot. Mm -hmm. Or those sorts of people, you might compensate for this poor inheritance of your intuitions by consciously thinking about what's going on. And in this case, our book could be helpful to you, at least if you have the mental capacity to walk through the arguments and understand them and apply them. Mm. Otherwise, awesome. maybe if you're not an exception, maybe you don't want to know, honestly. You think you want to know. I'm not so sure you do. It's <laughs> <That's> very funny. <laughs> well, it's interesting because then, and then you, you map out <clears throat> You know some of the the whys, right? I think in the in the in the first part of the book, you guys, you know, kind of lay the groundwork for why why are we hiding our, our motives? You give a whole assortment of, of of topics here. We don't have to go into all of them so deeply, but there's some of them that are that are interesting. So obviously, you kind of start with this evolutionary model uh, of you know social grooming, competitive altruism. You talk about our big brains and our IQ, but I guess there's two things I want to ask about, right? We, you can touch on those if you, if it's relevant, but, um, cause I think I want to emphasize these two points because I feel like we see them a lot in, um, in real life, obviously. And then also socially as well, or excuse me on, um, social media and things like that, which is this idea of, <clears throat> we have this, we we've, stated the value of prestige and, and stature or status, right? And folks that have read uh, Joe Henrik will, will know that he talks about this as well. Um, so I guess from your perspective, why are we emphasizing those things? And then the second thing is about signaling, right? Isn't most of human behavior, we're always signaling something. And why? Why are we trying to signal something to others? I'm signaling to you right now that I read your book and that I made some cool questions. Maybe I know a few things. Other people signal when they put certain icons or they put certain kinds of things on their profiles or whatever. There's, there, it's a certain type of signal of sorts. We're always doing this, right? We're always doing this. And why 
why are we doing it and how do we not recognize that we're doing it to certain levels? So I said we are social animals, very social. One of the elements of being social I described was we have norms and you want to make sure you're not violating the norms. But even more fundamentally to social animals, social animals form coalitions. Uh, subgroups of the larger group of animals, and they want to appear to be desirable members of coalitions, mm. and they want to appear to be loyal members of coalitions. They also want to look at others and make those judgments about others. Who else would be a desirable member of our coalition, and who is, in fact, a loyal member of our coalition? These are extremely central features of group living um, on just very fundamental grounds. Can I just jump in real quick? Is this true of all social mammals? So this is true for us as humans, but would you say this for, you know, various other primates for dolphins? It's true orcas? for primates and smart animals who are making these distinctions. So uh -huh. many animals say have herding mm -hmm. and herds are often not really making much distinction. Mm. among the animals around them. Mm. They're sort of following with the herd, but not trying to be around particular other members of the herd and not so much forming coalitions mm. in a larger structure coalition. So to form coalitions, it actually requires a fair bit of cognitive capacity. First of all, you just simply have to recognize different animals differently. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to remember what they were like and reason about their behavior in terms of their ability and their loyalty. And you have to be able to have larger groups where you can mm. basically, you know, for example, you need to look at A and see how they treat B mm. and then reason about whether that makes them loyal or not. So you have to reason about whether B is supposedly part of the same coalition of U and A mm. and reason about whether their behavior toward B is loyal or disloyal and what that suggests about how you should treat A. So mm. it's actually fairly complicated mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to manage all of that. So simpler social creatures do something simpler. So for example, a chickens have a pecking order. So much simpler social creatures will have a, a status hierarchy that's mm. often maintained by even relatively simple social animals. But managing coalitions is something that takes a fair bit more capacity. Hmm. Hmm. So I guess that, that makes that makes perfect sense. That makes perfect sense, and especially when we understand various definitions of intelligence. Right, intelligence is some way of of making distinctions. Right, we're trying to uh, have certain ways of solving novel problems or difficulties. So once you realize that central to human behavior is rating and ranking each other, and you know, evaluating on ability and loyalty, and then forming these coalitions on that basis, then, then the focus on status and signaling makes a lot more sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because then, you know, that's almost the central thing to be doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Judging each other both on uh, sort of overall respect, and on who's with who. Mm. Mm. So why don't people recognize this deeply? Is, it, is there a type of self we can talk about self deception and denial in a minute, but is, is that part of it? Or like, if we're, if we're all doing this and we're doing right. this because we have to compete, we have to survive, we have to, you know, it has many pro social and adaptive functions for us in different contexts. Why wouldn't people be more, uh, honest oh. about this or open? So, so it comes down to now knowing about the norms people have mm. and which of these things violate which norms. So one norm that humans have long had is a distinction of two kinds of status. One is dominance and one is prestige. And dominance is not okay and prestige is. Mm -hmm. So uh, one reason to be less aware is that you're in fact acting or respect, you're projecting or respecting dominance when you're not supposed to. Mm -hmm. So uh, we typically pretend that dominance is prestige mm. because prestige is okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you're often aware of who you consider prestigious. Mm -hmm. we, we view that favorably because it right. usually is more, you know, seen as positive. 
right? So you're allowed to think someone's prestigious and then to try to emulate them and defer to them even because of their prestige. Mm. You're not allowed to accept someone as dominance and then defer to their dominance because of their dominance. You're supposed to resist and defy such dominance. But both, to it. but both are needed though. And we've used both throughout time. Well, the norms declare that dominance is not needed. <laughs> You must defy dominance. You should not and never accept dominance. You should resist dominance. And that is a distinctive feature about our ancestors' worlds. They were, in fact, pretty severely anti dominant They were very egalitarian mm -hmm. and very against well, any expressions of dominance. So that's forbidden. <laughs> you can acknowledge prestige and respect prestige, but not dominance. So that's one part, one norm you see that makes us hide our views of status. Hmm. The thing that makes us hide our view of signaling is that we're not actually supposed to have subgroup coalitions. <laughs> so think of a firm, right? A firm of, I don't know, 50 or 200 people or something. Like a law firm. Right, for example. Mm -hmm. At the firm, you're supposed to be arguing for things or against things on the basis of what's in the interest of the firm as a whole. Yeah. You're not supposed to say we should do this because that'll screw this other division that we've been fighting with. <laughs> You're not supposed to say that at least to the entire firm as a whole. Uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, and, and all through many other social groups, the norm is there's just the one coalition of the whole. Mm -hmm. And one is not to create or support or act on subgroup coalitions, smaller coalitions than the coalition of the whole. Mm. Um, but is, so, that, is that is that because it will it will splinter too much? And then yes, you that is we're trying to prevent splintering of the larger group mm -hmm. and infighting. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So one way to suppress infighting is to declare that there are no groups to infight over. <laughs> <laughs> mm. There are no divisions. Therefore, mm -hmm. there can't be fights between them and to suppress those sorts of fights. So people have to pretend to do things for the larger group's social purpose, mm. even when they're often acting for the, the benefit of a smaller coalition. Mm. And that's very common in most human organizations. I guess the idea here for me that's hard for me is there's a lot of helpful things to that, but there's also a lot of negative aspects to that. When you're just going with the group, uh, that leads to groupthink, and you can make some pretty bad decisions, no? Yes. Well, but people have the norm then often that a certain kind of disagreement with the group is noble and valuable, but it, it can't cleave along subgroup lines. Right. You just have to address yourself to the group as a whole. And I think I think the group holds. Let me just say, I think the group as a whole might be making a mistake here. Let me explain why. But, you know, if I can't convince you, I'm going to go along with you because I'm still with the group. But, you know, please reconsider this because. Mm. And then, you know, that's how you're supposed to deal with that. Can I give an example? Sure. So one thing that I've noticed. Um, I might get people upset at me about this. So <laughs> is I see this on social media, right? People signal a lot on social media yes. in various ways, right? right? It's very obnoxious. Um, I, I get it, but it's obnoxious, at least for me. So for one thing, I've seen certain uh, folks when we had many Black Lives Matter uh, protests and many things in 2020, in the summer 2020, and obviously you know, there was a tough summer in a lot of different ways. People were putting in their profiles, this kind of black, uh, all black, um, picture right on their, on their, on their profile, whether on right. Instagram or maybe on, on their Twitter or Facebook or whatever, as a way of showing that they were aligned with this group or what, or what was happening. And well, you see, and you see and one last thing, and you see the same thing now. I don't know if it's the same people or different people where people will put the Ukrainian flag right. 
in their profile, like right in the name. Like it's not just like yes. somewhere on the. It's right. You read the name, yeah. and it's it's this, right. you know, and, and 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 I've even seen this scaled up to like uh, when I when I sometimes when I watch uh, uh, you know s- certain sporting events, there's like there's like the, the the colors from the one team and the colors from the from the home and the away team, and then there's like the Ukrainian flag, and it's like oh man, it's like three different colors on there. I'm like right. you know. And like there, you even have it scaled up with certain companies in that way. We're signaling, hey, we're in solidarity, if you will, with this group or what's happening. Right. You know, we we want right. to 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 really de- you know defend or support these folks. You know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's not necessarily wrong to do. I'm not making a moral judgment. I just question why do people feel the need to proclaim that? You could still like I I, I mean I have my uh, opinions and feelings about those two groups I just explained in positive ways and all these things. But why do we feel this necessity to signal? Yes, yeah, so, or you know people do this with the the pride flag on and on. You can think of various examples. Right. Why do we feel this need to proclaim that? so loudly sometimes for whatever our group is why can't we just not do that and people could say could ask you think of somebody who is accused of a crime say lightly the first reaction is going to be are you crazy i mean a common reaction especially like if you've never heard of this before and you think this is crazy is to think that's crazy how could anyone think that i would do such a thing Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not even going to dignify that with response. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm just going to pretend like nobody ever said such a thing because that's just crazy, right? People would, the first simple stance people want to take with respect to any accusation about themselves is that no one would take such an accusation seriously, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Once the accusation is pushed farther, <laughs> mm-hmm. people will realize that, okay, that stance maybe not going to fly. And they'll have to defend themselves more. And then they might be indignant that they need to, but then they will. But then they will try to show that the accusation is incorrect, Mm -hmm. (laughs) that they are, in fact, innocent. So this is, I think, how we think about loyalty. That is, uh, in general, we all want to take as our first stance that, of course, everyone would accept that we are loyal. Of course, we're loyal. How would anybody dare think we were not? (laughs) But then some people want to go a little farther and you know you might think it's insecurity or passion or something they want to like us show their loyalty Mm. and maybe even by implication show that others are not fully loyal Mm. uh there's a a move to to be more loyal than thou Mm -hmm. to be holier than thou basically Mm -hmm. and you can see how it could be a tempting move especially for someone who is otherwise suspect in some way Mm -hmm. Right. If if somehow the, the, the group is not giving you the full respect you think you deserve or questioning you in some way, you might compensate by trying to show all your good features as best you can, which includes your loyalty, mm. which is, you know, and so people want to show their loyalty and they feel bonded by mm. that in some sense. They're showing loyalty. So, I mean. The key thing is, I said there's this norm against subgroup coalitions, but it's okay to show your loyalty to the group. So a big question in many contexts is, what's the group? Uh The group isn't the set of all humans ever through all of history. (laughs) Right. Okay. And so people are in some sense arguing about the group. So in some sense, when people put up the Ukrainian flag, they're saying anybody in this audience should think of their group as the pro-Ukrainian group. Mm-hmm. And they're really sort of making a bid for their entire group in terms of all the people who watch that sporting event mm-hmm. or participate in that mm-hmm. they should all see themselves as part of the pro-Ukrainian group and mm-hmm. against the pro-Russian group. Mm-hmm. And so often, you know, there's a larger group and it's somewhat ambiguous. What are the stances of that larger group with respect to various things? And then sometimes people want to take the stance. You know, by declaring that this larger group has the following stance that we all agree on, mm-hmm. and then try to make that stick. Mm-hmm. And that can be a way to sort of promote things and get your way if you can make it stick, right? right? So, for example, if 
you know, you are a vegetarian mm -hmm. and the world around you is ambiguous with regarding vegetarian. If you could declare all reasonable people are vegetarian, can't you agree? If you can make that stick, well, the world would become vegetarian, mm -hmm. right? And you would have achieved that, right? So activists of many sorts are tr often trying to make the bid that all reasonable people, i.e. everybody in this conversation who sees themselves as part of this large shared group should agree that X, and if you can make that sick again, you've got everybody behind X. Mm. So it's, it's a tempting move to make if you think you're close to being able to pull it off. And arguably in most of these spaces, they are correct about that with respect to the Ukrainian Russian war. Mm -hmm. Most of the people will, but of course it might be 85, 15, mm -hmm. but that can be large enough that every, the 15 is going to shut up mm -hmm. and not assert their different opinion because they make it shouted down and that will create all the more stronger impression than everybody agrees. Mm. Really? Like a consensus of a group isn't what everybody in the group agrees with. That's not what a consensus means. Mm -hmm. A consensus is the thing that everybody says for fear of getting squashed. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> see, see, I, guess, I guess this is why the signaling piece bothers me. It doesn't always feel sincere. And I care about sincerity, authenticity. Uh, well, they, they both sincerely see themselves part of the larger group and sincerely think that their ex should be the thing the group agrees on. Yes, that, yes, yes, yes. That may be true. But as an example, right? Let's say exactly what you're saying. This is the, the consensus of the group. I don't really care one way or the other. I think it's a terrible situation, blah, blah, blah. But I'm going to do this so that way people know that I'm, they know where I stand on this. They don't want a, a question mark about like, well, right. well, what does this guy think? Well, he doesn't say anything about it. Or, you know, sometimes right. people will say like, you know, silence is violence. You have to say something. You got to make a right. stand. You have to show your allegiance to whichever group or whatever. And I, and I sometimes, to me, the thing that's kind of concerning is I could see people kind of going along to get along. So that way they can show that, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll do this. This isn't that big, big of a deal. So I want to make sure that I don't have to, I don't get squashed, right? Like I'm just going to kind of go around with the consensus. Yeah. And that's, <sighs> but maybe they don't really care. Maybe they don't even really feel that way. They're just signaling that because they don't want any punishment. Oh, Signaling that they're going to go, they're not going to question the consensus. They're going to accept it and go along. Mm. Mm. Right. But sometimes that's not sufficient. So in our book, we give this example of a rally in Russia when Stalin was the leader. Mm -hmm. And at the time, Stalin wasn't in the room, but his name was mentioned in a meeting. Mm -hmm. And upon the mention of his name, everybody stood up and started clapping. And they kept clapping for 10 minutes. And, you know, near the end, everybody's wondering, like, when are we going to stop? How does this end? <laughs> because they, nobody wants to be the first person to sit down because then they might look less loyal to Stalin. Right. And eventually somebody was the first person to stop and sit down. And that person went to Siberia that night. <laughs> <laughs> so you can be in equilibria there where the stakes are raised and it's about the slightly less loyal than others is makes you suspicious. Well, well, isn't, isn't this the, isn't this the kind of thing, right? Where like, sometimes if you're not saying or doing the right things, that's part of the majority group or perceived majority group or the consensus, you, you go to a, a, a proverbial gulag, which is you get canceled or we, we, right. we, we say, well, we don't want you because you did this one indiscretion, right? Like you could, you could, you could, you know, love all of the Harry Potter books, but you know, you, you're supposed to not like JK Rowling anymore. Like you can't say that you kind of like her, or agree with her or whatever, retweet what she said, because my goodness, you know, she's all of these things, but, and you can't even really say that you maybe you have to make that distinction now with Harry Potter. I like the books. I don't like JK Rowling. And if you don't say that, Ooh, it might be, might be some eyebrows raised. Right. Cause then all of a sudden you agree with everything she says, apparently, I don't know. Like it, that's just one example that pops to my mind. It does seem kind of like you're an example. Everyone's, you know, clapping for Stalin and who's the first guy that's not going to do it. Yikes. You know, he's going to be out of there. 
It, it feels, a, I mean, uh, this right. is a now, very bad ex example, but, you know, it seems similar, no? So there are many cases of a group leader who is challenged or offended by somebody else in the group. And then the advice given to the leader is often, if you retaliate against this person too strongly, you will look weak. Mm -hmm. You should instead project strength by mm -hmm. showing that you don't even feel threatened by this person mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and just let it slide off because you are strong and you're confident in your strength, right? But then there are people like Stalin, who was not so confident, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. who then made sure that everybody who slightly opposed him was got rid of, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They disappeared. So, so in some sense, this regime of strong enforcement of these norms shows insecurity or, or weakness, right? Mm -hmm. They don't feel that confident, mm -hmm. because otherwise they would just shrug it off and raise their eyebrows and like, be very sure that this person would suffer because of course you would mm -hmm. for saying such or thinking such a thing. Right. Mm -hmm. So that means that shows you that it doesn't always happen and why it doesn't always happen. Right. It happens when there's a crowd who feels insecure or, you know, which could be because they're rising or falling. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could have a falling regime feeling insecure, and that's a sign that it's going down. Or you could have a new rising faction, a new revolution, or, you know, that this is a sign of it's rising, but it's still insecure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, another distinction to keep in mind is the distinction between, say, law and mobs. Mm. So through most of human history, we didn't have law. We dealt with pretty much everything via mobs. Mm -hmm. That is the way to deal with somebody doing something wrong was to gossip about it and create enough fervor and sense something should be done and then talking, agreeing what to be done and then do it. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of mechanism you're seeing here. But then, you know, roughly 10,000 years ago, humans introduced law and law has, you know, a key innovation that deals with a problem of mobs. So one of the main things that goes wrong in mobs is when one person in the mob tells another person that they're mad about some third person and they tell them their accusation of what this third person has done, the listener is tempted to go along with the speaker because they're connected in some way. And the person they're talking about is not in the room. Hmm. And usually less distantly connected. So the usual best social strategy would be to agree with this complaint and to share their outrage and share their recommendation, right? It's going to be a little harder to resist this outraged person who is your associate telling you they want you to be outraged and say, well, hold on a minute. How sure are you about this? And how well do we know this person? Or what about these other things about this other person who's not in the room? So there's just plausibly a rush to judgment with mobs. Hmm. That's just a general problem with mobs. And laws avoid the rush to judgment through the hmm. simple expedient of saying somebody's going to decide this and they need to listen to all the evidence before they decide. That's the key thing. There is, there's going to be a judge and they are not to decide until they've heard all the evidence. And that means that prevents a, you know, some worst cases of rush, rush to judgment, they will at least hear the other side. Hmm. And that's good. That's a way in which law fixed problems with mobs, and that we then less, less suffer the rush to judgment of mobs in our world today, except when it's an offense that isn't against the law, it's only against the mob. Hmm. So mo most of the cancellations you see are about offenses that are not illegal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the main reason is because they're new offenses. They didn't exist much before. A new movement is trying to make them be offenses and uh -huh. enforce them, uh -huh. but they're not against the law. Yes, yes. Well, but maybe guess, they should. Well, I guess that's the concern. The concern is that I don't want to say the mob in general, but the mob is highly or heavily influencing institutions. Yes. 
and that that that, that's to your point right if institutions if the the law the institution of law is being um influenced or persuaded or run over by quote unquote the mob or a certain faction of people that's problematic no right but like imagine that for some reason we had forgotten to make murder illegal Mm -hmm. okay Mm -hmm. Somehow it just had never been an option Mm -hmm. and suddenly murder became an option. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the law hadn't gotten around to make murder illegal. Mm -hmm. Now murders start to happen and some of us get really mad. We would in fact be feel completely entitled correctly. I would think in invoking mobs to deal with murder until the law could get around to making it illegal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. That is, mob justice on average is probably better than no justice Mm. Mm. Um, a world with no system of justice to deal with some kind of problem is worse than a deal with mob justice even if mob justice has a rush to judgment it's still going to have some justice Mm -hmm. but law justice could be even better so yes yes so my, I would actually say, look, if we're going to cancel all these people on the basis of these offenses, let's just make a law against these things and then let's handle it in court. And then both sides can present their evidence. And at least we won't be railroading people who didn't do it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. At least we'll only be punishing the people who actually did the things yeah. instead of everybody else who happens to get in the way. Right. Yeah. No, I, I, I firmly agree with you there. I think that that's part of the, there's a void and where there's a void or there's some, there's some novelty like you're saying the mob justice is handling it but that just means that we just need better laws and better ways of trying to figure out how do we handle these things i think it also highlights the fact that if you mess with law you're causing big problems so i I do think in fact we are slowly making a legal system that's less accessible to people and less usable what do you mean well it costs a lot to go to court (laughs) oh oh yes yeah yeah, terribly so okay so that makes it less accessible you Uh, must uh use it for things Mm -hmm, mm mm-hmm Um, Mm. and you know, the more expensive and cumbersome and, you know, time consuming and delayed Mm -hmm. the process is, the less you're going to be tempted to use it to deal with any given injustice. Mm -hmm. And therefore the more you're going to be tempted to do other things. So if you remember the stories about the middle ages, where they had various kinds of, you know, trial by combat or ways to settle justice in the the middle ages, like in Europe. Like th- throw the witch in the pool or whatever, see if yeah. she floats, things like that, right? Or yeah. just have two people fight to see who yeah. is correct about their legal things, right? That looks like a bad legal system, right? From our eyes. They're not actually considered the evidence of the case. They're just like seeing who wins a fight or something. But the reason why they had that system, I'm told, is that they had a good, decent legal system, but they had just made it impossible to use by making it too expensive. Hmm. Basically, what they had done is made that anybody who testified if there's any error whatsoever in their testimony, then they would uh, suffer enormous punishment. And so nobody was willing to testify about anything. And so the courts just couldn't handle dealing with anything. And so that's why they made up this other legal system is to have an alternative. (laughs) So it has often happened in history that societies have just let their legal systems rot Mm. so that they become inaccessible and unusable. And then they have to invent other legal systems to Mm. replace them. Often mobs. I, I I really do like the way you're you're looking at it and thinking about it because it, it makes a lot of sense in my mind. And I think that that's that seems more of the kind of the bigger structural problems and, and how to kind of fix some of these things, I think would be to do that. It's not gonna fix everything, but I think that it would be more advantageous for us. Um so two things real quick. Uh you talk about you've been you've been talking about norms and so i'm curious about this and then i also talk about self-deception so in terms of norms um how how do we do how do we as humans as a group as a coalition how do we we get to a place where we say yes this is a norm now we do this and that and that a changes through time and b that looks different in different cultures right? In different places all around the world. Now, there are some things that transcend that are cross-cultural or whatever, but you know, like you don't, I think for the most part, you know, it's not okay to cheat on somebody. It's not okay to steal from someone. It's not okay to murder someone in many cultures on average. So there are some maybe quasi-universals, if you will. Um, But how do we do, 
how do we get to norms? How do we how do we evolve that? And why do we say that that's a again? It's not something we all we all say. This is now a norm. Here it is. We just kind of get there and evolve there. How how does that happen? And why do we lean so heavily on them? So as I said, that was a fundamental feature of human organization for a million years before the last ten thousand. In a sense, it was one of the key defining features of humans compared to other animals. Is that mm-hmm. we could manage larger groups because we could enforce norms mm-hmm. through language and weapons. Mm-hmm. Um, but and we are plastic about norms in the sense that even though there are some norms that are just very common almost everywhere, there are many other norms that just vary from place to place and time to time. So clearly, they are plastic in that degree. I also think people don't quite notice that there's a spectrum of very serious big norms. And then there's really a lot of tiny Mm. norms that we hardly even notice Mm. that we don't actually put much moral weight on. It's more a matter of convenience and coordination. Could you give an example? Thinking about, um, for example, say there's a double door and you go in somebody's right. Just one door in front of another, like two doors. Oh, uh uh-huh. You go open one door and then open another door, say, right? Some bathrooms do this. It's very obnoxious. Right. And then maybe there's somebody behind you. And should you just go through both of them or maybe (laughs) hold one door open and let the other person go by and then they hold the door open and then you go by, right? (laughs) Yes, yes. Okay. So, I mean, it's kind of trivial, but still, there is a matter of coordination there, right? Like, which way should we do it, right? You don't want the door to hit the guy in the face behind you. Well, you might not want to, but the question is, what should you do? So there's just a thousand little things like that, Uh where in fact, different places do do it different. Mm -hmm. And we just have to coordinate. Like, for example, last night on the airplane, basically, I saw somebody violating what to me was a norm, where, you know, when you're getting off the plane, each row stands up and tries to get out. And then sometimes somebody from the row behind will see an opening and a whoosh pass the row ahead of them. You don't do that. (laughs) But where they come from, you do. Right. I was on a plane two weeks ago and it's, you you, you do everything. And that's why everyone's standing there in the back frustrated for 30 minutes. You've been on the, on the, on the, on the tarmac or whatever it is. And it's like, God damn it. Like I just, we all know how to do this. Pull your bag off the fucking thing and just roll it out and get out of there. And everyone's like, you know, trying to figure out where their bag slid and it's taking an hour for one person. And then you just do it row by row by row by row till you get to yours. But you can see that's not a law. (laughs) Right. And there's just details about that, that, you know, people could disagree on. Mm-hmm. And you're not going to call the police on someone who violates it or even slash their tires. But you can see how the more we agree on little things like that, the smoother things can go. Right. So in some sense, you can see norms being constructed in environments like that, especially as they're new. That is basically we, we fumble around and we kind of like notice some patterns that would work a little better. And then we do them and then we kind of show them to other people and hint about them and then maybe give a little disapproval to someone who does it different so that they get the idea that we're going to do it this way. Mm -hmm. And that's where norms come from. Mm -hmm. They just grow from there, right? That's Mm -hmm. the sort of the the entry point for norms at the very simplest level. Is is it always like an efficient thing? I guess not, right? Sometimes it might be like, I'm thinking of a modern one, right? So like, for example, if I send a text message to somebody, so texting is a very, right. yeah. very normative thing for our world. Everyone does it around the world every day, every hour. Right. If I send a text message to somebody, there's a certain type of norm and or expectation, I guess you could say, of how how soon you're supposed to respond. Right. Like and if you don't respond, ambiguous. yeah, and it's totally ambiguous, but some people right. will say, why didn't you respond? It's been an hour. It's <laughs> right? been an hour. Like, what the hell, man? Like, this isn't right, exactly. this isn't a long form email. I didn't leave you a voicemail. This right. is a text. What's the and then for some people it might be like two days. So, like, even for things like that, there is a lot of gray, but like So we're we, working out those norms, right? <laughs> yes, we are. It's, and it's probably everybody. based on that, like the cues about the topic or the urgency of the message uh-huh. or uh-huh. the shortness of it or the you know, the closeness of your connection, right? We're working out those norms. We haven't worked them out. Mm-hmm. fully 
And that's where they come from. But like the stronger it is, the more that's at stake, the more clear it's been that everybody understands it, then the more upset you'll be when people violate it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And eventually that'll be in the law. Mm. Right. Or if as necessary. Yeah. So it's just interesting though, how norms evolve, right? So like for 10,000 or or up until 10,000 years ago, we had certain norms because of how we were as a, as, as a, as a, as a human race, but then as things in the environment and things in culture and things in society change, then we have more norms or norms are always evolving. Well, we also drop them. So, Mm -hmm. I mean, we may just always have roughly as many as we can handle. Mm -hmm. And as we try to add more in some areas, we're going to drop more in other areas. Mm. Like, you know, for example, we don't all wear hats anymore and we don't tip our hat when we (laughs) see somebody and we don't take our hat off when we go inside a building. And I I mean, (laughs) bunch of norms we got rid of right <laughs> this is all, all of my daughter's generation they don't know what this is they, don't, they have no right. idea they have no idea right, <laughs> right? so that's true that's yeah, true we do drop some norms it's interesting i wonder i wonder i wonder how it is it, it i'm just so curious about like when we do and when we don't how it just like over time we just stop doing it little by little by little by little and then we just don't do it anymore like that that process is very fascinating to me I mean, obviously, at the moment, people are trying to generate, say, norms around pronouns, right? Uh huh. Uh huh. Right. And so, should you ask mm-hmm. what, what, you know, how closely should you adhere to someone's requested? Mm-hmm. When should you notice that, right? I think the, the one sticking point here with the pronouns is, um, I mean, obviously, people, right, have different opinions and ideas about this. And some people put way too much emphasis one way or the other. But I think the one piece of this that's interesting is that the fact that folks that typically or historically wouldn't do this, right, or, or haven't done this, are, there's a sort of implicit, well, even if you don't uh, cite your pronouns or you, you, you state your pronouns, you should still put that in your email signature, or you should still put that in your right. uh, profile on your Twitter page or whatever, you know, even if you just you know, it, it may seem obvious right. or you don't care about it as much as maybe somebody else does. You should right. still do it to generate that norm. So it's a thing that people don't uh, reject for certain folks that are um, right. may, may have different pronouns. So that right. sometimes so, is also difficult. And it seems to cross the line from sort of efficiency into sort of promotion. Yeah. Because you could say, well, look, if there's the usual pronoun and I don't say anything, just assume the usual about me. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. people want to say, no, that's not good enough because then you're not showing that you're with the cause Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. and you want to support this pronoun thing. Mm -hmm. And in order to show that, you need to actually affirm the usual thing. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting to see where that will go, right? (laughs) People get very upset about it. And so again, both sides of this. I mean, you know, you've probably seen Jane Austen movies or things like that, right? So a, a prototypical elite Victorian world, you know, they have enormous number of norms mm-hmm. about exactly how to take off your umbrella and what to do in this room and how to address that person, right? Yeah. And so it, it seems like in some worlds, you will just accumulate more norms mm-hmm. <laughs> just so that people in that world can distinguish themselves from other people. That is the the uncouth mm-hmm. visitor from a lower class or a servant, I mean, or whatever. One of the king that will distinguish them is they won't know exactly all the right things to do in the right circumstances, and mm-hmm. then therefore they won't do them. Mm-hmm. And so you could just distinguish yourself that way. I mean, one of the ways elites, educated elites in our world, distinguish themselves is just by having larger vocabularies, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. using bigger words, right. right, right, and they often even have a norm that. You should use certain bigger words, and they are not, are not happy if you use a more populist, simpler word mm-hmm. in place of a sophisticated word. Right. And many people go to many lengths to uh, vociferously try to <laughs> show. Th- yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Right. But then, but then <laughs> that's signaling to other folks like, oh, look at this fucking asshole. He's just so pretentious. Like, you know, yeah. you can't talk like the common folk and just right, say, right. Of you course. know. Yeah. So, I mean, how many people are really upset by being called pretentious? I mean, honestly, <laughs> that is, in fact, people are trying to be, I mean, a lot of people are trying pretty hard to be pretentious, right? <laughs> right. 
they, they don't want to be called on it. They don't want to be quite because basically being told you're pretentious is, is basically doing it too obviously, right? <laughs> right, 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 right. I mean, what the, what they mind is they, they got caught, right? Right. Not that they're doing it. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I would agree with that. Yeah. It, it, it is very interesting. It, it, I, I have to, I have to think about it. I have to think more about the norms piece because it's, it is, I, you can tell how essential it is, but it's also interesting how in a modern world where things change so fast, how norms are continuously changing. And again, it's not a new thing. It's just interesting how I, I find it interesting. The when it happens and when it when it doesn't happen you know, if like we've done this and now over time we don't and then we we don't do this and now over time we do it's very interesting how how those things play out so just like we might think vocabulary increases too large relative to what you need in order to show off we might well think that norms accumulate to be too many mm. maybe compared to what you need so that people can show off that they know and follow the appropriate norms Mm -hmm. that people will invent new problems so that they can have norms to solve them mm -hmm. so that they can show that they are good people who follow the rules. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so in some sense, like at least in many people in my world, there's often this common complaint between say men and women in relationships because the women just have a lot more rules mm -hmm. that they're invoking mm -hmm. and applying. And the men are saying, Really, we need, we need to do that. Why do we need to do that? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They're saying, but the proper people do this. That's what I've heard, right? <laughs> and you know, the, it's maybe about sort of how ambitious do you want to be about mm -hmm. following every rule you ever heard of mm -hmm. or could admit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's also it's also another really interesting point there. Just real quick before we kind of move on, I I want to ask about self deception. We talked about it a little bit, but people do this all the time. I mean, I do it, you do it, we all do it. But I mean, like there's some things of, we just lie to ourselves. We lie to ourselves often. What is there an adaptive functioning? I mean, I think you're talking about in the book, you, you talk a little bit about Freud, you use it as a defense, right? <laughs> Denial, uh, manipulation, and that you talk about how self-discretion is better. Now, before you answer, have you read that book, uh, Denial? Um, I don't think so. It's by Danny Bro Brower and uh, two authors and... It's a, a jeet something or other. I don't remember the I don't remember the names. It's about self deception and the evolution, uh, the, the evolutionary history of why we would have false beliefs and self deception and denial and things like that. It's very interesting. And they basically they talk about religion in there as religion is basically one function of it was to develop a system over time for various cultures to uh, different religions so that way they don't have to think about all of the awful things about dying. And so it's like, well, if you're able to know that, you know, you go to an afterlife or you, you live well here and something's going to happen and you'll be saved or whatever, it's a, it's, a, it's a very elaborate, abstract way for our human brains to say, yeah, well, we just do that because, um, you know, we just don't want to think about dying. It's not the only thing religion was, was uh, evolved from, but they, they posit that maybe that's one, one uh, organized part of it, et cetera. So I guess for, for, for in your book, you guys talk about... <clears throat> self-deception why do we deceive ourselves why do we lie to ourselves why, why do we do this so robert trivers yep famously said that we deceive ourselves to make it easier to deceive others <laughs> right that that's the fundamental purpose wasn't he all about uh, reciprocity though i thought he was trying to well, he, was all about <laughs> he also was about reciprocity that but the idea is that we people we leak a lot basically. Mm. Mm. And so if we consciously deceive, then we're maintaining the thing we're saying, but the thing we're thinking, and then what we're thinking leaks a lot through our tone of voice, our facial expressions, mm. our, you know, our, our speed, our nervousness, all sorts of things. Mm. So um, in order to successfully deceive others, we have to have it deeper inside the truth that we think mm. and not more closer to the surface where all these leaks will come out from it basically so um more into the unconscious mm. and that seems roughly true to me those people are bad actors mostly most people <laughs> yes most people think they can detect lies better than they can but still people are pretty bad actors mm -hmm. and so you know we celebrate the few actors who are good um because it's hard mm -hmm. um 
So we deceive in order to deceive others. Now you might say, you know, I, I, most of the discussion say about self-deception is about how, in fact, can you manage self-deception? And is that even possible? Mm -hmm. uh, because you have to have these separate accounts of what you think and keep them straight separately and not mix them up. Mm -hmm. um, and there is a fair bit of complexity there. Mm. But then again, if you think of the press secretary story, it'll help you understand your conscious mind has just not been told a bunch of stuff mm. about what's going on exactly so that you won't leak it. Mm. And therefore you've just been presented this nice looking picture and that's what you're going with. Mm. I think it's more interesting when we notice that we are self-deceived, how mm -hmm. we react. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it's actually not very binary so the, the simple description of self-deception has like there's the truth and there's this part of you that is lying and doesn't know it and there's just two separate agents right but as far as i can see there's much more of a continuum hmm. of times when we notice we're not being entirely honest and then maybe back away from it a little or distract ourselves from it a little and um it's more, more there's a lot of things in the middle hmm. Is is this the idea of self discretion somewhere in, in the middle or somewhere on the continuum here, or or is that outside? Yeah, I think of so. Us? Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, so we give the, the idea of self discretion mm -hmm. is that you are sort of quiet about some things about yourself that you can sort of see, but you're not going to call too much attention to. Isn't that withholding? Isn't that what people say? You're withholding, or you're, you're telling a half oh, truth, right, or something? Of course, we we are quite often, <laughs> even usually. Yes, telling half truths. <laughs> We shouldn't do that. We should just have this. You know, but so many people will say this. They'll really say this. I can't believe somebody unless I can believe them a hundred percent. And I, I just find it laughable. It's ridiculous. Well, nevertheless, it's exactly the sort of thing you're supposed to say. Otherwise you seem to be accepting your own self deceptions, right? You're supposed to take the stand that I completely resi re resist and reject that. <laughs> we, we lie every day, but, but okay. Is this maybe some aspect of like, is this what Nietzsche said is the shadow of God, right? It's just, we just have all of this stuff. Like we, we're, we're in a secular society, but we just have all of these things where like lying is bad all the time, a hundred percent white lie, big lie, little lie, half truth. It's just a hundred percent bad. And if you acknowledge, well, yeah, I lie sometimes. Like it's just a taboo. Yeah. Like we're going to put you on the leper colony because this guy is dishonest and he lies. Is, is that another norm that we have of like, you can't trust someone that lies even though it happens all the time, every day for everybody. So at this point, I may want to introduce the concept of sacred. So okay. that's not something that's in the book, it's something I've been thinking about for the last few months. Go ahead. Yeah. But it's a way that helps us in not seeing some of these things. Hmm. Um, so we, we have a, a bunch of things where groups bond themselves to each other by seeing the same thing as really important okay so you know when people believe in religion religion is sacred and sacred is something they bond together in our society perhaps more medicine or democracy are i think, I think of things. art this way um art, art yes yeah uh, for right? me, so yeah. they are they are like very important to us mm -hmm. and there's a bunch of other correlates of the sacred that go along that you know, it's the stuff I was trying to use to understand the sacred to try to explain, um, under you know, what's going on with the sacred. Mm -hmm. So, for example, sacred things are um, larger than yourself. You sacrifice for it. Mm -hmm. They are more pure and enduring than other things. You idealize and simplify them. Sacred values, you do them for itself and not as a means to something else. Aesthetics tends to matter more when they mm -hmm. touch special days, places, or rituals. They make those sacred. Sacred things are set apart. They're not supposed to be mixed with other things. They don't really supposed to conflict with each other very much. They're not supposed to trade profane things for sacred things. They're not supposed to have prices. They're not supposed to consciously analyze them. You're more supposed to feel the force, mm -hmm. uh, not measure them with numbers. Mm -hmm. These are some of the correlates of the sacred. And the question is like, why do these things all go together? What's the common theme here? And mm -hmm. my explanation would be in terms of the a concept in psychology called construal level theory. Okay. And so the idea there is that 
And like, if you're looking at a scene, you see a few big things up close and then lots of small things far away. And the few things you see up close, they're more important to you and you see them more in more detail. Mm -hmm. And the faraway things, therefore, the, you have descriptors about them, but they're abstract. Mm -hmm. And they're also not so very important. So, uh, and that this near far, you have sort of different styles of analyzing these two things in your mind. You have sort of different mental capacities for thinking about things that are up close and far away. And if you think of something up close in space, you tend to assume it's up close in time and chance and importance and social distance and sort of theory generality and goal generality. And you, anything that's near in one way, you tend to assume is near in other ways and vice versa. And then you think about faraway things more abstractly. And that's mm -hmm. a key mm -hmm. in less detail. And in particular, you have fewer distinctions you make about faraway things. And you're more sloppy in how you think about them. And you're even more intuitive and aesthetic because they, they don't matter very much and you can't afford to bother to think about them much. But it, stuff up close in detail, then you think about the details. Is it the distance, the proximal distal kind well, of thing? The is distance part of it? Is, is an abstractly, there are many kinds of distance. So mm -hmm. in some sense. Well, I guess in space time, right? Because something's right, far right, away. Space time is one of the distances, but also chance, like something that's very unlikely. Mm. Mm. is also far away in chance mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's true okay yeah. or something that has fewer social connections to you is far away in social distance uh-huh okay yeah. also yeah. in terms of goal generality so like when you're making choices you have some high level goals and you have some concrete constraints mm -hmm. so the concrete constraints are more near and the mm -hmm. high level goals are more far away mm -hmm. yeah, so yeah. you think more idealistically and and moralistic about far away things mm. because uh that's more abstract mm. so that's control level theory and it's a you know well observed set of correlations that we see about things and the idea is that sacred things the key observation is sacred things are things that are important to us especially important to us but nevertheless we're looking at them in a far mode sort of way as if they were far away we're treating them abstractly and the sparse descriptions and idealizing them and uh treating them as if they're associated with high level abstract goals mm. and things like that so we tr and then more aesthetically intuitively we are treating sacred things as if they were far away mm. so for example you know say sex is near love is far and you have people who have been in love for decades saying they don't really know what love is you know how could they not know what love is well it's just this <laughs> abstract idea who could really know what it means <laughs> what kind of love you know what kind what kinds of love you right know, yeah. exactly so you can see how they're treating love as far mm -hmm. uh and so the question then is like why would there be a set of things that mm. we treat as far away even though they're important mm. and then the explanation is because we're trying to see them the same way so think about medicine if, if you're sick and i'm not and i look at your medical case and your treatment i will see it from afar and you will see it nearby and now we won't see your medicine the same mm. if we treated it that way but if we want to see medicine as sacred it's really important that we see it the same way a simple solution is for you the one who's up close to also see it from far away and now we will agree about medicine and all the other things we treat are in love and God and all the other things we treat as sacred, we are basically successfully seeing them the same and agreeing about them, uh, overcoming the near versus far obstacle that usually we see things differently hmm. if we are up close versus far away by seeing it up close in a far mode. And therefore, we're less accurate that way. We're less, we less calculate well, we less reason well, we let we make fewer distinctions. We're sloppier and we suffer more losses that way, but we see it the same. Hmm. It's, it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a very interesting, I've, I've never thought of it that way. This is very fascinating. Is there something where we're trying to make it less cognitive and more emotive and more instinctual? Well, that's because far mode is like that. Hmm. That is that is characteristic of how you think about things far away, more instinctually, yes, less calculating, because and th they're far away and that you can't afford to pay much attention to them. Right, and and the fact of like, is there something? Hmm, that's interesting. Is there? 
is there a fear if it, if if we if we if we bring it too close then it changes what it is because we have more information and we know about it so all of a sudden well, it we, might we, not be the thing we all agreed on we, we fear losing the sacred view of the sacred uh, the sacred view of the sacred is precious to us mm -hmm, right mm -hmm, if mm -hmm. if we stop seeing love and only see sex uh -huh. we feel we've lost something very important I, I totally get it it makes perfect sense why why do we need that so, so that groups can bond together that is we've said like a central feature of living in social living is forming coalitions and groups uh -huh, yeah, 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 and yeah. showing your loyalty to them and this is the central function here of the sacred under this view is the central function is to show that you are part of a group by showing that you see it and their important things the same way as they do and in fact that is a common way people show that they are part of groups is that they see the most important things the same way okay so it's again a very novel i i really really enjoy the the way you describe it so i guess the question i have here is is what about when you have two different groups that are coalesced around a sacred uh idea let's say but those two groups sacred ideas are in opposition or they're well, very different is there going to then be conflict over this well they won't see themselves as part of the same larger group right that would be something that gets in the way but but certainly people have like they have different gods they pray to they, they well, just, one so, group sees so, it as sacred and the other so this has long sacred. been the essential problem with the pluralistic tolerant society <laughs> uh <-huh>. right? <laughs> right right that is in a pluralistic tolerance society, we could have the idea of tolerance be sacred. Maybe the idea of democracy is the way, and law is the way we settle disputes be sacred. But now, if you have a different religion than I, then you will see that differently than me. Then we can't. At that level, we are part of different communities. And now the question is, how much can we share in this larger society? Right, right. I, and I guess so there is this temptation to want to force everybody to agree about something so if we say think about homosexuality or gay marriage or something right mm -hmm. once upon a time we might say we did say well you know once upon a time we'd say we all agree that's bad right and then people would say no let's be more tolerant let's be more accepting mm -hmm. and let's not have that something we all agree on let's have that be one of the things we disagree on and therefore we the things that we treat as sacred that are the things we're uniting on perhaps you know uh, the general democracy and tolerance or whatever isn't it's not included in that anymore it's sort of been devalued as a topic really it's to to the extent you're treating a sacred it's not so important that it's going to divide us but then recently people switched around they said no we must all agree on this mm -hmm. we we cannot allow people to have the divergent opinions on homosexuality we must all agree that it's okay and it's to be embraced but but isn't that because we're reaching maybe further back so if we're saying the sacred thing we hold more important is not this aspect of of you know homosexuality but it's more of the human piece of things like this is these are human beings that love each other and we care more now about that sacred ideal right. or ideal of their humanity or but human could, nature you could apply that to any other thing we dis ever disagreed about oh, about the humanity piece but yeah i mean you could have tried to overcome any disagreement with that basis already mm -hmm. you, could, you could say for example hey you know people who don't believe in democracy they're human too mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or people don't believe in the law they're human too why should we feel so antagonistic to people who disobey the law and disvalue democracy Mm -hmm. why not embrace them too and you might think well you know people don't want to do that if like democracy and the law are sacred to them mm. so i guess the other thing is is does does there is there sometimes this thing where if you are too too invested in whatever your group's sacred value is or the sacred whatever it is that it puts blinders to other people that don't have that and that well, could cause that's, disharmony that's its point its function is to create those blinders so yes of course it's going to that's why it exists but isn't that problematic for other groups 
Yes, but for ask yourself, are you willing to have nothing be sacred? Uh huh. So, th- so I think if you so ask it that way, you'll say no. There's I a sacrifice you- by making one thing of sacred. You're making other things not, and so in in, in essence, you're you, you you either have nothing or you have something or some At things least something that are sacred. But mm-hmm. whatever you make is sacred, it's going to blind you uh-huh. to people who disagree about that thing. Going to make you less tolerant of them, less willing to consider their arguments and the details that might mean there you should compromise on these things or mix them up with your sacred things. Everyone, I think, listening should ask themselves: Is nothing sacred to you? And in fact, I, I can give you a list of common sacred things just to make it sure. clear here. Yeah, sure. I could say, here's some of the sacred stuff in our world: nature, yep, medicine, liberty. School, friends, charity, sex, love, art, law, gods, family, birth and death, nations, democracy, the sky and space in some sense, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. sacred idealized things, history, the future, innovation, Mm -hmm. honesty, maybe even math. Like, there are people who treat each of these things as relatively sacred mm. and one of those words at least resonated with you when you oh, were yeah it was, uh, at least <laughs> five at least like six right. or seven of them right? okay. of course yes of They're course precious things right not just yes. good yes. things precious yes. things yes precious absolutely. things that shouldn't mix with their opposite that shouldn't compromise for their opposite that are idealized and simplified in your mind in order to make them precious mm. Mm. Well, it's, it's interesting because you're tapping into like this, I mean, you've probably were well, were well aware of this, but this like psychological emotion or concept of awe, a lot of these Indeed. things give us awe or, or, exactly. or reverence, re- yeah, reverence or awe or yeah. And it's, and it's those, yeah, it's, 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 it's not, that's the emotion with, I guess that, that I think right. of when I think of the sacred. Right. And that emotion makes you reluctant sort of to take it apart and analyze it and that's right. Ask, Ask That's right. when isn't it so valuable? What do they make gradations within it? What are the better versus worse versions of it? And mm-hmm. when, sh- how much should we pay for it? What's the price that would be worth giving it up for? Mm-hmm. Your mind is reluctant to go down this path. That's the function of the sacred. That's what it's doing. Yes, it's mm-hmm. blocking you from going down those paths exactly to prevent you from too easily mixing with the other people who don't share that as sacred. <laughs> right. That's what it's doing. That's right. why. It, it's the framing in which you're putting it is, is really, uh, it's kind of an unveiling of sorts. I guess the question I have is personally is you said you were thinking about this more recently. Why? So I have a lot of big ideas for how the world could change, big institutional change ideas. I want to and ask you about a few. Yeah, I've, yeah. I've got a lot of them here. Yeah, um, yeah. I don't know if how much time we'll have for them, but <laughs> they're, they're less popular as podcast interview topics, <laughs> but I, I I'm, I'm big on them. Yeah. And yeah. I've, when I look at why people are not interested or even hostile to them, the sacred is often an obstacle. Mm, mm. I just keep coming up against the sacred when I'm trying to do other things. It's just been in my way. <laughs> and so I finally said, let's what is it? <laughs> take this thing on. Let's figure this thing out. <laughs> Not just try to ignore it or pretend it doesn't exist or like, you know, slip around the side. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Let's take this head on. <laughs> It's so funny. I did not think that was the answer. I thought you were going to have some more romanticized answer. <laughs> I'm getting older. I'm seeing my grandkids. I was thinking, I thought it was some more. Rom- <laughs> but, but I still have to admit on reflection that I can't not treat anything as sacred. Mm-hmm. And that I'm going to have to pick some things. Mm-hmm. So I have tried to pick the few things I'm most willing to treat as sacred mm-hmm. and accept that the cost that comes with that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, okay. So let me ask, I'll uh, just ask this then. What are the ideas that, uh, that, that are the sacred was 
obfuscating <laughs> what was getting in that was getting in the way of you what, what were these ideas that you you people just so could I'll, I'll just quickly list some sort of what kind of problems they solve and then you can tell me which ones you want to hear more about okay yeah okay so um one is for example career agents that is i have a way that i could give everybody for free an agent who will like advise them on their career and promote them like actors and musicians have i can give everyone one of those for free and that mm -hmm. i estimate is like worth 20 trillion dollars <laughs> <laughs> and nobody loses okay mm -hmm. that's one solution another thing i was i'm just writing a post on right now is how we could replace gpas with uh better measures of who did how well at school and all similarly on jobs or even in sporting tournaments mm -hmm. instead of just doing simple averages there's a better way to do that um, I have another proposal for how, when you buy medicine, you could buy health, not healthcare, and actually make sure that they only give you the medicine that's actually useful and not the other stuff. <laughs> I have a proposal for how we could privatize most of criminal law by creating vouchers mm. who basically you tie each person to a voucher who's responsible for them and will pay a lot of money when they commit crimes to let them have a contract with each other that will punish them and limit their liberties as necessary therefore privatize much of criminal law by having us not have to decide together what's a cruel punishment or what are inappropriate limitations on liberties or things like that interesting and i have mechanism of governance by which we could just change how we decide things at the largest level so my slogan is vote on values but bet on beliefs <laughs> <laughs> and under futarchy, as I've called it, we could be much more accurate about the consequences of our policies while still allowing citizens to decide what our priorities are, but no longer trusting them to know the effect of policies on the outcomes they care about. Hmm. Um, so this is a sample so far. <laughs> Well, I am interested. I am interested. Yeah, I'm interested in the the stuff on. I uh, guess about the future, about. I guess maybe more of the the sci-fi elements of things. I know you're 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 interested well, in that. In some sense, all of these are sci-fi from my point of view. <laughs> so, maybe so, more I mean, the traditional. Well, let's walk. No, let's walk through it in the sense okay. that yeah, sci-fi is usually about how you know a world of the future, right? That's different from today. Right. And then the key question is, well, how is the future different from today? And usually people are thinking of, well, technology has changed, right? Right. Right. There's computers and robots and space travel or something, right? But social technologies are also technology. That's right. That's right. And so the future, you should expect not just to have different machines, but also different social institutions mm -hmm. and social mechanisms. Mm -hmm. And so, in fact, that's one of the more interesting ways this future could be different from today is by mm. being socially different. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I have this other book called The Age of M, Work, Love, and Life, and Robots Rule, Rule the Earth, which tries to lay out an entire different civilization based on a technology assumption. But I do have a small section in there where I go through some social changes that they might mm -hmm. also adopt mm -hmm. uh, as an improvement on our social worlds. So I see this as like the, some of the most interesting science fiction in some sense mm -hmm. is to show, because in some sense, you know, many kinds of technology like spaceships or something are technology where you get the basic idea. It just may take a long time <clears throat> to implement it to get all the details worked out. But the basic idea is something you can roughly imagine. Mm -hmm. And similarly true for many of these social institutions. Once you see the image, you can see, well, I'm not sure that'll work, but I see the basic idea and how the world could just be very different socially mm -hmm. if we had new institutions. And that's, to me, just as exciting mm -hmm. an image of the future. Mm -hmm. And in some sense, it's more feasible at things because many of these social things are just simpler institutions. They they aren't actually that complicated mm. to adopt. And so you can more see that it really would be possible. Whereas maybe maybe it's just not even possible to have starships or something. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, I guess okay, so say more about the the what did you call it? Futarchy? Futarchy, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So say more about that. Okay, so I'll start with um a simple example of deciding to fire the CEO of a public company. Okay. So that's one of the most important decisions that ever gets made in a public company is whether to keep or fire the CEO. Mm -hmm. And if we could get people to adopt a new mechanism for that, 
we could probably get them to adopt it for other things because that's you know one of the most prestigious things. So that would be my marketing strategy. Start from the top, get people to accept a new mechanism for the most important things they do. So how do we fire Tim Cook at Apple? If we should, how do we decide if we should is the key part, right? Okay, right. So the board of directors in general is responsible for firing a CEO if they think that's the, in the best interest of the shareholders. But the mm -hmm. question is, how do they decide whether it's in the best interest of the shareholders to fire mm -hmm. the CEO? Right. And usually the board of directors is there because the CEO put them there and, you know, owe a little bit to CEO and firing a CEO makes them look pretty disruptive and they'd like to be on other boards. And mm -hmm. maybe that looks like makes them look a little uh, troublesome. Mm -hmm. So they tend to be reluctant to fire CEOs. So mm -hmm. we, need, we want to give a nice, clear signal to them mm -hmm. about whether to fire the CEO. Okay. So think of an ordinary stock market in the company. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a stock. So maybe the current price is 22. Where's 22 come from? Well, what you do is you think about, you're supposed to think about all the situations the company could be in, the economy going up or down, this industry expanding or contracting, mm -hmm. having more new products or competitors, whatever it is. For each scenario you can think of, you should ask, in that scenario, how much is this company worth? Right. Uh, how much revenue will it produce in the future? How much cost will it have? And how much profit will it produce in order to pay off the shareholders uh, to make you know, the price stock price worth a certain amount. Mm -hmm. So you think of all those scenarios and each one, there's a different number for how much the company's worth. And then you average them all together to get what the company's worth. That's what you're supposed to do when you estimate the value of a stock. Right. And so at the, you know, you see the stock price is 23 and you think it's only worth 22. You should sell. I think the price is 21. I think it's worth 22. You should buy mm -hmm. that how people adjust to set the price. Okay. Now we're going to add two new markets to this company, which are just like an ordinary stock market, except they're called off. A called off market, the, you make trades, cash for stock in the same way, except if a condition isn't met, the trade is undone as if it never happened. Hmm. So you'll buy more stock, maybe, but maybe not because it'll depend on a condition. So you make a conditional trade. Now, when you're trying to make an estimate of the value of the company for a conditional trade, you have to, again, look at many scenarios, but only the scenarios consistent with the condition. Hmm. That would be the key point. And so we're going to have two different markets for two opposite conditions. One, the CEO stays in power till the end of the quarter, and the other, the CEO leaves by the end of the quarter. These are the two different conditions. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And now those should have different prices. <laughs> Because they're averaging over different sets of situations. One CEO is here, other CEO is not. And now when we see those two different prices, we ask, what's the sign of the difference? Is the company worth more when the CEO stays or the company worth more when the CEO leaves? The idea is that's the key signal to the board. If there's a substantial difference whereby the company looks like it's worth more when the CEO leaves, that's telling the board. Let's get rid of the CEO. If it's not the other way, then you want to keep them. If it's not clear, don't do anything. So you're exporting the decision-making onto a tangible monetary value. You're asking speculators to tell you whether to fire the CEO by asking them to tell you what the company's worth under different scenarios. Mm -hmm. And they have a financial interest in making those bets right because buy low, sell high, they can you know, make good bets about those conditional probabilities, they'll be fine. Now, only one of the two conditions will happen to happen. So typically they should trade on both sides of the market mm -hmm. and they'll, they'll only get a consequence from trades on one side. Mm -hmm. The other side won't happen and then all its trades will be undone and it's as if those trades never happen. But the trades on the side that does happen, those have consequences. And if they bet wrong, they lose. If they bet right, they win. So now... We are asking speculators to tell us about firing the CEO. So that is futarchy applied to a public corporation and the particular decision of keeping the CEO. But I hope you can see how this generalizes. Oh, I'm going to guess that people aren't really crazy about this idea. <laughs> well, it has some sacredness <laughs> obstacles. Yeah, what's, yeah, I was going to ask about that. What's the sacredness obstacle? I'm interested. So money... <laughs> <laughs> yes. is involved here. Prices are involved here, yeah. but leadership is sacred. 
and as a general a, a abstract concept or or a specific type of leadership well our leaders are sacred okay that is the our loyalty to our leaders our attachment to our leaders it's not just a you know calculational practical mm -hmm. choice mm -hmm. there's something higher about our approving of a leader and choosing to have or keep a leader yeah yeah, it's just a, it's a, it's a, it's a positional thing, right? It's a representation of, you know, you're leading or heading or charging right? for the so group. They, all this. They, they represent us and our ideals and yeah. Yeah. we yeah. keep them there because they continue to symbolize for us that we have these ideals that they will be true to. And we get angry when they don't. Yes, of course. <laughs> right. So, um, you know, this people get suspicious about money being a volunteer and they try to imagine all the things that could go wrong mm -hmm. uh, because this seems like it's also like we're the people making this decision aren't high enough status. So we have many ways in which we use status to allocate decisions and powers in the world. Mm -hmm. And often we are just willing to trust someone on someone because they have high status. Mm. So yeah, if you it's, ask it's a heuristic. Like, it's a heuristic. Right. Yeah, right. right. And Heinrich, as you said, you know, yeah, yeah. shows how that is plausible in many mm -hmm. cases. Mm -hmm. And so when there's an important high, important decision, people want high status people to make it. Mm. And they're not so sure the people trading in these markets are such high status people. Mm. Mm. So, um, so back in 2003, which is now almost, you know, now 19 years ago, mm -hmm. Uh, it's going to coming up soon the 20th anniversary i was involved with a project funded by darpa which was trying to see whether they could do betting markets on geopolitical events relevant for the department of defense <laughs> and uh there was a monday morning where two senators had a press conference just when the darpa pr person happened to be out of town and unavailable coincidentally declaring the Department of Defense was having betting markets on terrorist attacks, and this was terrible and immoral. That was it, my project at the time. Uh, just, just for the sake of argument, is it? Is it immoral? Mm -hmm. Well, they were, I mean, they were saying that, so, so the question is, what would go wrong if you had betting markets on death? So basically saying, because death would be involved here, it's immoral to bet on death. Now, as you may know, life insurance is betting on death. I was, I was going to say, I can think of other, <laughs> other, other, other contests. Well, life insurance had a long road in order to get people to accept it. It was hard to initially accept mm -hmm. because, in fact, people didn't like the idea of betting on death. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, our markets were only going to have a few tens of dollars per trader. So, you know, there wasn't that much involved. So people thought like, oh, maybe people would like cause deaths in order to win bets in the market or, you know. People might throw millions of dollars in the market to manipulate, to mislead people. And the sorts of things they raised as concrete scenarios of problems weren't actually problems, but they just thought there was this moral rule. You shouldn't bet on death. I mean, more fundamentally, we weren't actually proposing to bet on death. Yeah, it was, it was, we were, gonna propose, we're, we were going to talk on geopolitical events in the Middle East. There was just a sample example that somebody had put up of say Arafat being assassinated, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, something we might bet on. And that was used as the evidence that we were going to try to create bet on terrorist attacks. Mm, I see. Because in fact, we were mostly going to talk about, you know, changes in who's at war or who has what economy grow or what head of state changes power or things like that. Mm -hmm. So. But over the years, I've, I've you know seen that many people feel, and so one of the things that people said in that criticism was that look, important intelligence decisions should just be made by important intelligence people, professionals, not or not people who traded markets. <laughs> mm. It was as a matter of sort of the status appropriate to the topic should match the people involved. It's like an aristocracy, no sort right? Exactly, mm -hmm. the a justified aristocracy that right. people think. There are there are top good people the in the intelligence world, right? And they should be the ones who who make these decisions. Not ordinary people should be not be involved. That's mm -hmm. inappropriate. Mm -hmm. And in fact, that's kind of how the CIA has done it. So there are in fact now prediction markets in the CIA, <laughs> but they are there under the following 
simple rule. The coin of the realm in the CIA is white papers, right? Reports. Mm -hmm. Somebody wants to know what's happening in Afghanistan. They ask for a report. Some group does a report. They issue a report. The report is read by somebody, maybe eventually the president, about what's happening in Afghanistan, right? Mm -hmm. And reports cite each other. One report builds on another and gives credit to the other. And that's the coin of the realm in the CIA. Then they let these prediction markets exist under the condition that they, nobody's allowed to cite them in reports. Nobody, the, the market's never allowed to get credit. Mm -hmm. So then it never threatens the prestige of the reports and their prestigious authors. Mm -hmm. It's never some low people who might be trading in the markets who would somehow be threatening the prestige of the report and the pristine high status of mm -hmm. the people and the, the report that could go to the president. Mm -hmm. So you see how it's sacred. Yes. Mm -hmm. And in some sense, well, that is one way we often deal with sacred things is making sure only prestigious people can touch them. Hmm. This is kind of, this is not related, but this is kind of like how the Pope functions. Yeah. Sure. So priests and the, and bishops, et cetera, are more prestigious. And that's mm -hmm. often said that if you're going to respect God, you should respect the priests, right? right? right. It's, the prestige of God is coming mm -hmm. onto the priest and you should give them more deference and quest less question their judgments mm -hmm. because of that. And of course, medicine is sacred in our world. And so we're not supposed to question doctors right? Right. and non prestigious people are not supposed to do medicine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Even if it's relatively mechanical and easy, it's too important to let ordinary people touch unless mm -hmm. they are under the supervision of a sacred priest of medicine. Hmm. Hmm. It's just very, it's a very, it's very interesting. I, I can, I can feel some of it <laughs> pushing on my intuitions of sorts. It's very interesting. I, I, I don't, I, I really like the, 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 the idea or the concept. And I think it is really, really fascinating. Okay. I know, I know you've, you've been generous with your time. Just um, maybe for for next few minutes, it's a maybe a strange thing to to end on, but I want to get your ideas on this. Tell us about, <clears throat> uh, in one sense, in a very literal sense, the future, um, UFOs, aliens, alien life. Yeah, you know, big topic. All these things. Okay, I'm yeah. curious. I'm curious for your ideas. I'm curious for yours because I I understand this is another another area right. where you've you've dabbled in this. What do we make of all this? I mean, there's so much stuff out there. Can we say anything? So I'm going to try hard to like summarize a lot in a short space. Go here. ahead. Go ahead. Because this is a big topic, right? Yeah. I can spend yeah. hours on this. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. So the universe at the moment looks empty. Yep. As far as you can see on the big scales, it's all as if it was always dead. Mm -hmm. That's puzzling. If the universe were full of aliens and they, you know, grew and progressed and then were greedy or ambitious, they would do stuff. They would change stuff. Mm -hmm. And then we would see a lot, mm -hmm. but we don't see anything. Mm -hmm. So one simple conclusion is, okay, it's really hard to do anything. And maybe we're just completely all alone. Mm -hmm. no, there's just nothing out there. We're just all completely alone. But okay, maybe there's some out there. We can't be so sure we're completely alone. Um, and so we've come up with a simple mathematical model that tries to describe the distribution of aliens in space time based on three parameters, each of which we can fit to data. And when we do that, we say, okay, there are aliens out there. They appear once per million galaxies. <laughs> they appear, they take like on average, roughly our date in the universe, 14 million years to appear. Mm. At the moment, half the universe is full of them and expanding out and filling the universe and another billion or years, two years from now, it'll all be full. And the universe from then on will just be full of advanced aliens doing stuff. Mm -hmm. How can that be consistent with our looking and seeing nothing? Well, they're expanding very fast. And that means if we could see them, they'd have been here by now. <laughs> and then we couldn't be here. Mm -hmm. So there's a selection effect mm -hmm. there. We can only see empty stuff because that's the only way we can be here. Mm -hmm. So the aliens are expanding very fast, half the speed of light or more. They appear once per million galaxies slowly over time appear according to a power law actually we're roughly a power of six so they appear much more frequently later than earlier on which is why they're going to fill up the universe pretty soon 
And that's the story. Now, this is the story of loud aliens, the aliens that would be big and visible. Mm. What about other aliens? Couldn't there be others? Well, there could be quiet ones. That is, every civilization that eventually becomes loud starts out as quiet. Mm. So we could ask about the ratio there. Maybe many of them stay quiet, don't do much, go away, have limited ambitions. And so the ratio between quiet and loud uh, could be higher, could be small. The smaller this ratio is, the better our future odds look of becoming big if we wanted to get big. <laughs> On the other hand, if we hope to see aliens at least somewhat close to us, the larger this ratio, the better it would be for that chance. Mm. So that's the simple theory of the paper we published in Astrophysical Journal on what we've called Grabby Aliens. You can look it up at grabbyaliens.com. If you say, well, what about UFOs? Couldn't those be aliens? Well, the first thing it says, well, this story doesn't really very positive about this. It says they appear once per million galaxies. So the chance that another one is really nearby is really, really low. Mm -hmm. You say, are you sure? And I say, oh, okay, well, let me come up with another variation on the theory to try to explain that better. So what I've done is to try to say, okay, if I'm going to try to estimate the prior probability, say that UFOs would be aliens. I would need to ask, what story can I come up with where that could make any sense at all? <laughs> and then ask, what's my prior probability on that? And so my answer is, I can come up with a story that has roughly a one in a thousand chance, I guess, which is high enough to means you need to look at the evidence because say that usual prior probability in a murder trial is maybe one in a million, and you, you still allow people to make murder accusations and look at it. So here, the prior is one in a thousand. You, you need to look at that. Just to be clear, you're making a distinction between aliens existing in other places and UFO sightings that we have as two different things. Right. So the, the first grab the aliens model just says there are aliens out there. They're just really far away. Right. And you won't meet them for another billion years. <laughs> so they're just crazy far away, but they're out there in the universe. There's, there's lots of them, thousands of them out there in the observable universe. There's plenty of them out there. They're just really far away. But you're the down, UFOs you're are by definition nearby, right? So that's the yeah. puzzle about UFOs. They would be aliens who are close. The question is, how could we understand that? And aliens are are just another entity, or, or or it's not green little green men necessarily. Aliens are just anything that is just another any organism. any very advanced life. So oh, advanced obviously, okay. like something that, for example, could travel between the stars. Right. So right. If, if UFOs are aliens, they have to be pretty advanced, right? right. Not they microbes. <laughs> right. Exactly. Right, right, they, right. They, they have to be able to travel and visit here. So, <laughs> so then you ask, can we come up with a scenario by which there actually would be aliens here doing the kinds of things they appear to be doing? <laughs> and I got, and I say, well, one in a thousand, I'll give you that. And <laughs> so that's not crazy, but it's not one. <laughs> it means you have to look at the evidence, right? right and right. so if I look at the other explanations we can offer for UFOs, I'd say, well, there's the, it's just random delusions and mistakes. That just doesn't work very well, I don't think. There could be some other hidden organization with very impressive capabilities they haven't advertised. That's just hard for me to believe on prior grounds in the sense that it's just really hard to hide such organizations. And the other possible explanation is that it's a hoax organized by some large organization like, say, the U.S. military. And they've been doing this hoax for a long time and putting a lot of effort to it and getting people to lie and faking pictures and everything. And that's doable. And I give that a one in a hundred prior. What about this idea that maybe it's us from the future and we've come back? That's worse. That is, <laughs> if, if time travel is possible that way, then, then the question is, why isn't the whole universe full, right? Mm -hmm. You can, you can go anywhere in space time if you mm -hmm. can time travel. Mm -hmm. So now any one civilization anywhere in space time could fill the entire universe all the way back to the beginning if they can do time travel. Mm -hmm. So the empty universe becomes much more puzzling if time travel is possible. That's now fair. you say like, how come nobody is from any civilization and any future time when it's possible? How come none of them have gone any of these places we see? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so what do we make about UFOs? W what is it? Well, I, mean, I, mean, I think basically, so I've got these priors. One in a hundred on a hoax, one in a thousand on aliens. And then I say, you have to look at the evidence, right? And that's not my specialty. That's I, I can say I'm an expert on social science in general and the universe in general. I'm mm -hmm. thinking about the basic priors here, which are important. Mm -hmm. But if you want to judge actually, are UFOs aliens? There's no escaping looking at the details of these particular reports, right? And that's not my expertise. I have looked in the, I can say, 
The evidence offered to UFOs looks to me more persuasive than that you can find offered for ghosts or fairies. <laughs> okay, it's better. <laughs> I can also say there's stuff that was thought similarly says so silly to UFOs that eventually turned out to be true. Okay, asteroids, for example, rocks from the sky, mm -hmm. or ball lightning, mm -hmm. or the sort of pink octopus like lightning very high in the sky that people reported and didn't believe there are some things that people think that's crazy mm. and then turned out to be true so that's the situation like you got a reasonable prior you've got other stuff that looked crazy that turned out to be true this thing looks a little stronger than some other crazy stuff after that point you got to look at the details and that's mm. not my thing mm -hmm. so that's where i gotta stop and say mm. whoever whoever wants to take on that job <laughs> Go for it. Mm. I've, you've got my sport. Mm. Needs to be done. Mm. But I'm not doing it. Mm. It's very interesting because people become very they become very animated about this stuff. They really, they really, you know, they, they talk about Area 51, but then they also talk right. like recently all the Pentagon released these videos right. of these, you know, air. Well, but plans. one of the things that animates people here is the status conflict. That is, you know, most authorities are quite adamant that this is silly and stupid. And so if you want to identify with the authorities, you, you take on that sort of strong dismissive mm -hmm. stance, right? Mm -hmm. If you feel like a rebel and, and, and contrarian and you want to take down those assholes who think they're so smart, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and this looks like a great way to do that, right? Mm -hmm. They've been so confident and arrogant that this couldn't be true. And if you could show them wrong, you'd show that you're, you deserve to be ranked higher mm -hmm. compared to what people thought for, and they deserve to be ranked lower. So. I think a lot of the emotional energy is just the mm. let's bring down the the powers mm -hmm. fight mm -hmm. the power right <laughs> yeah because there's a lot of other topics that are like similarly potent and interesting but you know doesn't have this sort of status dynamic yeah yeah well i guess the last question i have for you is you know, obviously you have so many interests and you've written on so many things and your, your, your discussion on the sacred was particularly, um, illuminating for me. It was very, very interesting. What, um, where do we see our future for humanity? You know, where, where are we going? Where, where do you see things going for, for our human race and for us as a society? Just kind of, if you look forward, you know, five, 10, 25, 50 years. Where, where so do you see if, things if going? If you look at the last century or two, we've had some pretty steady trends. Mm. Mm. So if you want to go ahead a century or so, I think just going with the past trends is pretty safe. Mm. Uh, but, you know, a couple centuries ago, we had this huge change called the Industrial Revolution. Right. So I think you got to expect in another couple centuries, we may well have another change that huge. Mm -hmm. And my book, The Age of M, is about one version of what that could look like. Uh, but then I've also been thinking about sort of more robust things you could say about the long-term future. And one of them, I think, is we'll eventually have a choice between becoming a quiet or loud alien civilization. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, it won't be an easy choice. Uh, I think there are strong arguments on both sides. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to like be preparing people to think about that choice. It's not soon, not immediate, but not not too many centuries from now we will face that choice well i mean robin i could talk to you for literally hours more and more hours I mean, well, you're, maybe you're, we'll do it again yes absolutely you're you're you're, you're such a, a captivating uh a speaker and it's very interesting your ideas and they're they're I, I find them very very fascinating and you know your 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 books are great. The most recent, "The Elephant in the Brain," "Hidden Motives in Everyday Life." Are you working on another book or or no? I am working on two, but um, <laughs> I'm reluctant to say because I I'm not often like doing what I promise on these things. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good I to know like... that you're working on something. That's that's the good news. <laughs> um, I will tell them more when I have something to show. Yeah. Well, where can people find you? Uh, where well, if you, you know, want them hansen.gmu.edu or at Robin Hansen on Twitter. Mm -hmm. Search just Google my name, say on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you so much for, for coming on. I, I really had so much fun. It's just a, a blast and have to do it again. And it was very nice to meet you. All right. Thank you.